Uh, can, can we talk about phosphine a little bit? Um, so you love mentioned it's a pretty. I <laughs> love phosphine. <laughs> What's your Twitter handle? It's like Dr. Phosphine. It's I think. Dr. Phosphine, yes. <laughs> you will be surprised here. It wasn't taken already. I could just, <laughs> I just grabbed it. <laughs> Didn't have to buy it off anyone. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what? Uh, what is it? What, what's phosphine? Uh, you, you already mentioned it's pretty toxic and um, troublesome. And what? what and troublesome. outside, trouble. Sorry. That's <laughs> no, the, I love it. I'm going to stop the calling it troublesome. <laughs> the, 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 so maybe what are some things that um, make it interesting chemically and why is it a good sign of life uh, when it's present in the atmosphere like you've described in your paper uh, aptly titled the phosphine as a biosignature gas in exoplanet atmospheres i suppose you wrote that paper before venus i did you- yes <laughs> i did <laughs> and no one cared you know in that paper i said something like if we find phosphine on any terrestrial planet it can only mean life and everyone's like yeah that sounds about right let's go and then venus shows up and i was like are you sure i'm like <laughs> i was sure <laughs> before i was sure now that is right here um i'm less sure <laughs> now that my claims are being tested so phosphine Phosphine is a fascinating molecule. So it's shaped like a pyramid with a phosphorus up top and then three hydrogens. It's actually quite a simple molecule in many ways. And, you know, it's the most popular elements in the universe. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. When you add hydrogen to them, it makes quite simple, quite famous uh, molecules. You know, you do it to oxygen, you get water. You do it to carbon, you get methane. You do it to nitrogen, you get ammonia. These are all molecules people have heard of. But you do it to phosphorus, you get phosphine. People haven't heard of phosphine because it's not really popular on Earth. Um, We really shouldn't find it anywhere on Earth because it is extremely toxic to life. It interacts with oxygen metabolism and everything you know and love uses uh, oxygen metabolism. And it interacts fatally, so it kills in several very imaginative and very macabre ways. So it was used as a a chemical warfare agent in the First World War and most recently by ISIS. So really bad. Most life avoids it. Even life that might not avoid it, so life that doesn't use oxygen metabolism, anaerobic life, still has to put crazy amounts of effort into making it. It's a really difficult molecule to make, thermodynamically speaking. It's really difficult to make that phosphorus want to be together with that hydrogen. So it's horrible. Everyone avoids it. When they're not avoiding it, it's extremely difficult to make. You would have to put energy in, sacrifice energy to make it. And if you did go through all that trouble and made it, it gets um, reacted with the radicals in the atmosphere and gets destroyed. So we shouldn't find it anywhere, and yet we do. This is kind of weird molecule that seems to be made by life, and we don't even know why. Life clearly finds a use for it. It's not the only molecule that life is willing to sacrifice energy to make, but we don't know how or why life is even making it. So absolutely mysterious, absolutely deadly, smells horrifically. When it's made, it produces other kind of diphosphines, and it's been reported as smelling like garlicky, fishy death. Mm. Uh, Once someone referred to it as smelling like the, let me see if I remember, the, the rancid diapers of the spawn of Satan. Oh, very nice. Yeah, very, very vivid. And so See, you're a poet after all. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't call it that. Someone else okay. did. Right. And so it's just this horrific molecule, but it is produced by life. Mm. We don't know why. And when it is produced by life, it's done with enormous sacrifice. And the universe does not sacrifice. Life sacrifices. And so it's this strange, contradictory molecule that we should all be avoiding and yet seems to be an almost an ambiguous sign of life on rocky planets. Okay, can we dig into that a little bit? So what on rocky planets, what um uh, is is there biological mechanisms that can produce it? I mean, is there is there you said the why is unclear why life might produce it, but is there an understanding of what kind of mechanisms might be able to produce it? This very difficult to produce molecule? We don't know yet. The enzymatic pathways of phosphine production by life are not yet known. This is not actually as surprising as it might sound. I think something like 80% of all the natural products that we know of, so we know biology makes them, we don't know how. 
it is much easier to know life produces something because you can put you know bacteria in a petri dish and then watch and then that gas is produced you go oh life made it yeah. that actually happened with phosphine but that's much easier to do of course than figuring out what is the exact metabolic pathway within that life form that created the this uh, molecule so we don't know yet phosphine is really understudied um no one had really heard of it until so, so now-ish. What you were presenting is the fact that life produces phosphine, not the the process by which it produces phosphine. Is there an urgency now? Like if you were to try to understand the mechanisms, the, what did you call them, enzymatic pathways mm -hmm. uh, that produce phosphine, how difficult is that of a problem to crack? It's really difficult. If I'm not mistaken, even you know the scent of truffles, obviously a billion dollar industry, huge deal. Until quite recently, it wasn't known exactly how those scents, those molecules that create this incredible smell were produced. And this is a billion dollar industry. Wow. As you can imagine, there is no such pressure. There's no phosphine lobby or anything <laughs> that would push for this research. But I, I hope someone picks, picks it up and does it. And it isn't crazy because we know that phosphine is really hard to make. We know it's really hard for it to happen accidentally. You know, even lightning and volcanoes that can produce small amounts of phosphine. It's extremely difficult for even these extreme processes to make it. So it's not really surprising that only life can do it because life is willing to make things at a cost. So maybe on the topic of phosphine, what... Uh Again, you're, you've gotten yourself into trouble. That I'm going to ask you all these like high level poetic questions. I apologize. No, but, I would love it. Okay, <laughs> when when did you first fall in love with phosphine? <laughs> it it wasn't love at first sight. It was somewhere between a long relationship and Stockholm syndrome. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I, when I first started my PhD. I knew I wanted to learn about molecular spectra and how to simulate it. I thought it was really outrage, outrageous that we as a species couldn't detect molecules remotely. We didn't have this perfect catalog ready of the molecular fingerprint of every molecule we may want to find in the universe. And something as basic as phosphine, the fact that we didn't really know how it interacted with light, and so we couldn't detect it properly you know, in the galaxy. Just, I was so indignant. And so initially, I just started working on phosphine because people hadn't before. And I thought, we should know what phosphine looks like. And that was it. And then I read every paper that's ever been published about phosphine. It was quite easy because there aren't that many. Um, and that's when I started learning about where we had already found it in the universe and what it meant. Um, I started finding out quite how little we know about it and why. And it was only when I joined MIT and I started talking to biochemists that the that it be became clear that phosphine wasn't just weird and special and understudied and disgusting. It was all these things for oxygen-loving life. And it was the anaerobic world that would welcome phosphine. And that's when the idea of looking for it on other planets became crystallized because oxygen is very powerful and very important on Earth, but that's not necessarily going to be the case on other exoplanets. Most planets are oxygen poor. Overwhelmingly, most planets are oxygen poor. And so finding the sign of life that would be welcomed by everything that would live without oxygen on Earth seemed so cool. <laughs> And but ultimately, the project at first was born out of the idea that you want to find that molecular fingerprint of any of, of a molecule. So, and that this is just one example, and that's connected to then looking it for looking for that fingerprint elsewhere in the, in a remote way. And obviously, that then at that time, were exoplanets already when you were doing your PhD? And you, by the way, I should say your PhD thesis was on phosphine. It was, was all on phosphine, a hundred percent on phosphine, <laughs> with a little bit of ammonia. I have a chapter that I I, I did it where I talked about phosphine and ammonia. So I <laughs> got it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, phosphine was very much my thesis. Um, but at that that at that time, when you're writing it, there's already a sense that exoplanets are out there, and uh, we might be able to be looking for biosignatures for. Um, on those exoplanets? Pretty much. So I finished my PhD in 2015. Mm -hmm. We found the first 
exoplanets in the kind of mid to late 90s. So exoplanets were known. Uh, it was known that some had atmospheres. And from there, it's not a big jump to think, well, if some have atmospheres, some of those might be habitable and some of those may be inhabited. 